Thanks to Dr. Duran, the IMF, for the invitation. It's great to be back here. I did my med school here 30 years ago, so it's full circle. Uh, so, <clears throat> oh, these slides show up in the background, and I guess we can't fix that. Okay. Well, hopefully you can also follow along in your booklets. Um, so I think what this slide shows is uh, some of the drugs that we've had recently approved on the left, amalidomide, carfilzomib, Dara, Selenexer, and the lower the first bar shows how long the remission was, and it's about three to four months. And then for those who responded, how long that lasted, and you can see that's about eight months. <laughs> and now on the right side, we have these unprecedented responses. Uh, the remissions are now lasting nine to three years. Uh, the duration of remission is longer. And what's remarkable is that these are actually phase one studies. You know, the goal of a phase one study is not to really be looking at the response, it's really what's the right dose and what's the safety. And so yet in these patients who have over six lines of therapy, we're getting response rates of 60 to 100%, um, and the remissions are lasting over nine months. And I have to say one of the hardest parts about leaving New York, other than leaving my great team members like Donna, uh, was actually saying bye to the patients that I'd known for the last 20 years. And I was struck by so many of them. We had had hospice conversations, and now they're actually in their deepest and most durable remission thanks to these therapies. So if I had to paint a picture for you of why this is important, I think that, that, that speaks for itself. So <clears throat> there's a lot of things in the immune system that we could potentially target. On the left, you have the natural killer cell, the T cell in the middle, macrophages, which are kind of like the human garbage can cell, and at the bottom is myeloma. And I just the point of this is not to go through all the details, but it's just showing all of the important work that's going on to try to find the right new exciting targets. And today we'll be focusing on three that are circled, ECMA, GPRC5D, and FCRH5. And so we'll talk about bispecifics, CAR-Ts, a little bit about sequencing, some logistical issues, and then the everlasting question of CAR-T versus bispecifics. <clears throat> uh, so again, I. I don't know, the formatting is off, but the, the title of this slide is actually that every monoclonal antibody that we use in human beings owes its legacy to myeloma. And back in 1980s, a Nobel Prize was awarded for fusing a spleen cell from a mouse to a myeloma cell from a patient, and that hybridoma generated antibody. So every antibody, whether it's COVID, rheumatoid arthritis, it actually owes its legacy to myeloma. But myeloma did not get its first antibody approved for almost 30 years. Um, and we started with what we call naked antibodies and uh, antibody drug conjugates, which from Nupur. But now we're on the whole new generation. And so first we have what's called bispecifics. And all these antibodies typically have this Y-shaped structure. And at the tips of the Y are the binding to your target. What's different about bispecific is normally the binding is the same. So let's say daratumumab binds to myeloma at both tips. And now we have a unique structure where the red red part of the arm binds to myeloma and the, red, the blue part binds to your T cell. And at the bottom, you can see, you can play around with this. You could combine myeloma with an NK cell. So depending on what your partner protein and target is, you can uh, manipulate what happens. And so this is a table showing some of the uh, studies that are going on. Um, and again, if we break it into categories, first long list is BCMA, stands for B-cell maturation antigen. There's a couple for GPRC5D, and at the bottom, there's one for FCRH5, and there were two that were actually looking at CD38, which is the same target as DARA, but those are a little bit, um, you know, one is closed and one is not, uh, we haven't heard much about it. So a lot of progress, and, um, and we'll, we can talk about the data. <clears throat> and I should mention that it's actually remarkable that we're even talking about using these T cells in patients because... You heard about uh, from uh, Newport that one of the main complications of myeloma is infection, right? And why is that? Because myeloma patients don't have good immune systems. And no one thought that these drugs would be working like this well, right? Because you're taking a patient population that's typically in the 60s and 70s with impaired immune system. And are you really, can we expect these T cells to even work? And you'll see the data. So first target was BCMA, B cell maturation antigen. and um, you know, I, I, I'm going to keep this myeloma one-on-one. -on -one, so if you want to read the details, you all have the slides. But why am I showing you a picture? Because I think some of the side effects of these drugs are based on the principle of what cells express the target. So think of um, 
We all have T cells and T cells are like our assassins in our body. And if you're a myeloma patient, your assassins are kind of lazy and you need to wake them up. The one way of waking them up is to kind of have the T cells attack certain types of protein. So BCMA is overexpressed on myeloma cells. And that makes it a nice target because when you wake up your assassins, you don't want them to shoot every cell in the body non-specifically. So BCMA is overexpressed in myeloma. But if you see at the bottom right, when you go from a very immature stem cell to myeloma cell, there are some non-myeloma cells that also express BCMA that may explain some of the side effects that we'll look at. So um, what are the BCMA an uh, antibodies that we are, uh, are available? <clears throat> and you heard teclistimab was already approved. ELRA just got approved this week. Um, and so it, it's amazing in myeloma, you'll make a slide deck and literally as soon as you send it in, it's obsolete because the data is evolving so quickly. So this is now an obsolete slide deck, but these are just two companies, but there's also um, Linvo in the middle, AbbVie, Alnuctimab, other one called Harpoon. So what are the similarities or differences and what do you need to know as a patient? As, as a whole, the... Um, the schedule is maybe one difference. Some of them are given weekly. Some of them are given every three weeks. Some are given intravenously. Some are given as an injection. Sample, the number of patients studied varies. But in general, these are studies being done in very heavily treated patients, four to five lines of therapy, uh, triple class refractory, which means proteasome inhibitors, IMIDs, and CD38. You're seeing 60 to 80% or refractory. So these are sick patients. And yet, across the board, you're seeing an astounding 60 to 70% response rate. Keep in mind, Celi, Dara, Carfilzomib, Palm, when those drugs were studied, they had a 20 to 30% response rate, and these patients are even sicker, and yet you're getting better response. And that's why we're in this revolutionary immunotherapy era, and that's why everybody's so excited about it. Um, the remissions are also quite durable. The remission duration for teclistimab, which is one of the more mature ones on the left, is 11 months. And how long were the patients responded? How long did they stay in remission? 18.4 months. Uh, Elra just got approved, so those two are available now. The others will probably follow. And I think the take-home message is you have multiple agents in this category, all demonstrating remarkable activity. And you heard just from Daryl, why is this important as a patient and a, as a myeloma community? More drugs is better. If we want to drive down the cost, we need competitive agents, at least in a free market enterprise. And this is the first time we've had so many constructs in one category. Right? And so hopefully this will translate into better outcomes for patients, not just in US and Europe, but globally. Now we can have um, different options for these patients. So when you wake up your assassins, yes, they kill myeloma, but they release chemicals. The way they kill myeloma is they release um, certain cytokines and those cytokines kill myeloma, but they have other side effects, which is important for you as patients and caregivers to know about. And so the way we grade cytokines is um, uh, in the system shown here, most common symptom is fever. Sometimes people can, can feel a little tired. More severe would be low blood pressure. Uh, even more severe is uh, low oxygen. And so this is the main reason um, these drugs cannot be given by centers that are not trained. The FDA has mandated that all of these bispecifics and CAR-Ts have what's called a REMS program, which is, uh, requires healthcare teams to undergo training in order to give these safely. And for bispecifics, um, we try to minimize this cytokine release by a couple of things. We don't give the full dose of the drug all at once. We generally give what's called step-up dosing, so slow dose, and then you go higher and higher, making sure that those low doses are tolerated before you slam the patient with a full dose. Most of these also require 48-hour, uh, depending on the dose, 48 or 24-hour admission to monitor for that. Um, and just one thing I tell all my patients um, in general in myeloma, but particularly immunotherapies, is you don't have one, get a blood pressure monitor and an oxygen meter. You can get those on Amazon or whatever you want because you can see these symptoms are low blood pressure and oxygen. And so depending on where you live, I think in LA, it would be impossible. I remember in, uh, when I lived here, there's no such thing as driving with or against traffic, right? You're always against traffic. So if you're going to try to do these drugs as an outpatient and you need to be within 30 minutes of driving distance, that's not practical pretty much for uh, most people living in this area. And so it's important to try to have these at home for caregivers to know these symptoms and signs and call your uh, healthcare team if you see any of those. But the majority of these things happen during the admission and that's why they're done in the hospital. So what are the side effects? Well, the CRS that I mentioned across the board is quite common. It, you can see, depending on the study, it's as low as 27%, but that's a different construct. You're lo usually looking at 40 to 70% of patients will have CRS. 
Most of those are what we call low grade. So it's kind of like that fever. They don't feel great, but it's not the severe, like low blood pressure, needing to go in ICU, that kind of thing. That severe CRS tends to be less than 5%. The big one with this is infection. Um, and you can see uh, these, all of these are quite similar. Uh, Plistamab, the only reason I'm highlighting that one is it has the longest follow-up. So meaning patients were followed for 14 months as opposed to the other ones who are earlier in their data collection. But when you follow patients for 14 months, 76% of patients had infections, and of those, about half of them were serious infection. We're talking about having to go to the hospital for intravenous antibiotics for serious pneumonias, bloodstream infections. So this is the big side effect of this drug, and this is why I showed you that other slide at the beginning, because BCMA is expressed on myeloma. It's also expressed on some other parts of the immune system that may be getting hit secondarily. So the assassins are good at finding the myeloma, but they may be killing some of these other cells, which is why we're seeing complications of infections, including COVID. We had COVID-related deaths during the studies enrollment during the um, pandemic, especially before vaccination. So what do we do about that? Um, somebody asked earlier about IVIG. We've, we've looked at the role of IVIG. It does seem to significantly reduce the risk of infections. Um, antibiotics should be given, monitoring for infection. And then, you know, one of the things that the um, FDA... And I think as a patient community, you can appreciate this, is that when new drugs are developed, you take, as you saw, very heavily treated patients, and you're trying to find the right dose for those patients. And so we get this starting dose. But then does anybody actually think about what's the long-term dose? Because the starting dose is you want to capture as many patients as possible who are diseases shooting off, and you want to capture that and bring it back down. But the starting dose may not be the light, right long-term dose, right? And we've seen this over and over again, whether it's with lenalidomide, belantamab, pick your drug, often patients are being dose reduced. And so now there's this whole project Optimus from the FDA that mandates that every company needs to look at not just the starting dose, but what is the full picture in terms of efficacy and safety. Some of the things that are being looked at are fixed duration of therapy. So normally all the drugs you guys start continue forever, but when you have such great responses that are durable, can you actually stop therapy? Can you use lower doses? Can you use less frequent schedules? And those are all being looked at. And so um, stay tuned for those. And we'll see an example of a study that actually has continued therapy. So, but the nice thing about BCMA, yes, there's these infections, but it actually, other than that, there's really no other major side effects. And so it's not, I'm not minimizing that, but you got to um, monitor for that. But we'll look at some other targets. So GPRC5D, it's a mouthful. Um, this is a protein that sits in the cell membrane. Um, unlike BCMA, which you, some of you have heard about the probably valuable BCMA test, some of that protein actually is in the blood. So if you're trying to get your assassins to target the BCMA, some of them may be distracted by the blood protein, whereas this one stays on the cell and there's no what we call sink effect. What's nice about this is that GPRC seems to really be overexpressed in cancerous plasma cells. In normal plasma cells don't seem to have as much, which you'll see the side effect profile of this might be a little bit better. However, GPRC also expressed on certain unusual tissues, such as heavily keratinized structures, skin and nails, and maybe even some salivary glands. So the other new target is FCRH5. Um, we don't know a lot about this one either. Um, we do know it's overexpressed in myeloma. So again, making this kind of specific for our assassins to kill myeloma. Um, and not so much in other cells, but perhaps somewhere in between ECMA and GPRC in terms of the rest of the immune system. So how are these um, agents uh, panning out in clinic? Well, talquetamab was just FDA approved also within the last week. So again, these slides become obsolete. Um, multiple slides you can see became obsolete the minute I sent them in. Um, and there's uh, for Imtimig is a, another GPRC. So these are the two targeting GPRC. And then the one on the right, we call Sivo Sevastanab, uh, FCRH5. So the drugs, the GPRCs are given subcutaneously. The CVO is given IV. The schedule um, for TAL can be weekly or every other week. For Imtimig is every week, every two weeks. And then the CVO is every three weeks. These are relatively um, large studies. And again, across the board, very heavily treated patients, five to six lines of therapy, 70, but we're seeing responses of 60 to 75%. And um, one interesting thing you see in the middle is what is a new unmet need? Well, when you have all of these amazing T-cell redirections, what happens when somebody has a T-cell redirection but eventually progress? What do you do with somebody who progresses on a BCMA bispecific or a BCMA CAR-T? And you can see in 51 patients, this drug worked in 63% of those patients as well. So um, there's a lot of excitement about 
you know, the, how this might pan out in uh, sequencing. The remission durations were quite impressive, um, and Alquetamab updated data for the every two-week dosing is actually 14 months. And keep in mind that these are off-the-shelf products, so bispecifics don't have to be manufactured, right? So the shots or injections that you're giving wake up your assassins. They're like, you're basically telling the assassins, I'm going to paint the uh, cancer cells with a dye and you go kill, as opposed to CAR T, you got to manufacture. Talk about that later. So because they're off the shelf, this means that pretty much everybody can get them. If you're, if you're somebody whose myeloma is really progressing quickly, and you don't have the luxury of waiting for that elusive CAR T spot, waiting for manufacturing, this is good to go. Um, and theoretically could be given in the community setting as well, although I would caution that heard about the CRS, all of the management required. So these centers do need to be trained. Um, so what we're seeing is not only is there a competition within the BCMA space, but we also have non-BCMA non alternatives. And again, these are started with dose escalation studies, and we're seeing responses even in, in these dose escalation studies. I have to tell you, I have patients out over four years on telquetamab on those kind of initial homeopathic doses where we didn't even know the right dose yet. Um, and so it's a remarkable thing to have patients be on a phase one study uh, that far out. So what are the side effects of these? Again, that CRS we talked about, it's still there. We're looking at you know, 70 to 80%. High grade CRS, pretty uncommon. Infections may be a little bit less with telquetamab. You're seeing that um, all, grade, all infections is about 50%, but severe infections is less than 20%. Um, the rates of severe low blood counts called neutropenia, instead of 60%, we're now seeing about 30%. I, I would avoid from too many cross-study comparisons, but I do think that in our laboratory, for example, at Sinai, we showed that patients who got telquetamab could mount response to COVID vaccines, with, whereas BCMA antibody patients could not mount a response. And in BCMA, we saw COVID-related deaths. We did not see, in fact, you can see the number of deaths on this study was zero, um, which is really important. Because yes, we're going to talk about side effects, but you know what the worst side effect is? Death. So uh, I think the other side effects we're going to talk about are the dyskusia, which is loss of taste. This is a really um, important one. I don't want to minimize it. We all, I love eating food and to lose your taste is going to really affect your quality of life. And no one's minimizing that. And skin changes, we typically see rashes. It tends to happen early on, but quite manageable with steroids and creams. The nail changes, um, actually, I should shout out to Donna Catamaro, our nursing team at Sinai really led the supportive care effort. A shout out to the nurses all around the world who participate in clinical trials and help all of you guys. You're the ones, you know, you're crying on their shoulders. And when the doctor comes in, you're like, everything's fine. Yes. So they get the real. Um, but these side effects are generally manageable. The, this taste, we haven't found the, the magic bullet. The main way we've tried to manage taste is really by skipping doses and reducing. And a good example of that is when, for those of the investigators that participated in the dose escalation study, we didn't even see these side effects at the low dose. Um, we didn't see skin, nails, or uh, taste changes. It was only at the higher doses. And so uh, one of the easy ways of managing is really adjusting that. What's really exciting about the talcretamab is we, we've already heard some exciting combination studies. Because you don't have the infections and the neutropenia and the deaths, you can combine this drug with other agents. You can combine it with daratumumab, and you can also combine it with teclistumab, and those remissions are actually 18 to 19 months, which is outstanding for an off-the-shelf product. Um, and uh, SIVO, the other interesting, just a minute on that one, there was interesting data. So I think we're all interested in finding out, can these bispecifics be given as an outpatient? Um, we saw that the CRS rates are quite high. What if you give a treatment? All of these uh, drugs are getting pre-medications already. They're getting steroids, um, Tylenol, Benadryl, not forever, just those initial startup cycles. But in spite of that, you're having CRS of 70, 80%. So one of the thoughts was, why not give one of the treatments known as tocilizumab preventatively? If it's so common, why not just give it? And in the SIVO study, they showed that by giving that, you could reduce the rates of CRS from 80 to 36%. Uh, but there were still some rare, severe CRS. So maybe still not yet ready for outpatient, but that is one strategy that's being explored. I talked to you earlier about, we need to give everybody therapy forever. In the SIVO study, they actually discontinued therapy for one year, after one year. You can see that at the 12 month mark and almost majority of these small, it's a small data set of only about 18 patients, but the arrows in black indicate that those responses are ongoing. Um, so that's encouraging data that 
maybe you can stop therapy with these really potent therapeutics and not have to treat every forever. But again, we need more data. Um, and so what's going to determine by specifics? Um, I think we talked about side effects, combinations, a lot of these convenience issues. Um, I think the BCMA by specifics in, in particular, because the efficacy and safety is quite comparable, it's going to be, is it IV or sub Q? How much inpatient time versus outpatient time? How many step-up doses? Um, the schedule, all of those things. Um, and then we'll talk about RTs uh, and sequencing next. So we talked about using your assassins that are already existing, but lazy and waking them up with bispecifics. But another way of using your assassins is to take your assassins out, genetically modify them and supercharge them and put them back in with basically new weaponry. Um, and that's what CAR-T is and that's shown here. Um, many of you have had your stem cells collected. It's a very similar process, but it's a much shorter collection period. It's just one day, maybe one to two hours. That is one of the rate limiting steps is um, getting a CAR-T slot and actually getting space for apheresis. Most of the large academic centers that have this, you're competing with uh, stem cell transplants, leukemia, lymphoma, we're all competing for those same phoresis plots. So it's a real um, hindrance to CAR-T uh, expansion. So the CAR-Ts, these are those modified weaponry. You're basically putting supercharged T-cell receptors uh, that make these uh, T-cells really angry. And when you put them into the patient, they kill these myeloma cells. Um, and they, again, release these uh, poisons, if you will, that target the myeloma. So uh, the two approved uh, CAR-Ts are Idacel uh, and Siltacel, also known, you may know as Abecma and Carvicti. Um, these are both uh, uh, BCMA targeting CAR-Ts. Uh, one is made from a mouse and uh, the Siltacel is made from a llama. So it's uh, you might think, why is that? And that's how these constructs were initially done. And I'll show you some of the newer studies. Super heavily treated patients, six lines of therapy, uh, 80, over 80% 80 were triple class refractory. And in this heavily, heavily treated population. Look at those responses, 81 and 98%. And the remissions are lasting 12 years and almost three years, 35 months. So this, this is why there's so much excitement and everybody wants this, these therapies like yesterday. And there's a whole other assortment of activity in CAR-T. There's academic CAR-Ts being done at each institution. Um, we have several at UCSF. Um, there's alternative manufacturing uh, to uh, not use uh, viral vectors to make the put in the weaponry. There's rather than using mouse and llama, there's humanized ones. There's also two CAR Ts at the right targeting GPRC 5D. We heard about those for by specific, but now you can also do that for CAR T. And um, so, really, a lot of excitement about this space. And I think somebody was just asking me about this. I think um, what would I uh, recommend if somebody probably Siltacel is our single best product in terms of. Response rate of 98% and remission of three years. We've, we have no other products that are doing that. But um, one of the things that we know is if you give a BCMA therapy prior to Siltacel, so for example, a BCMA antibody drug conjugate or BCMA by specific, that preliminary data, it's a small data set of only about 20 patients, that 36 month remission goes to less than six months. So I really I counsel patients if you want to get Siltacel. One of the main benefits of that 36 months is you're cutting the cord from the cancer center, right? And you're not tethered to the infusion center. You can go travel the world. And now if you do anything to hinder that, we really need to think about that. So I think sequencing is going to be super important. Um, how, which BCMA therapy you give, how much, how much time were you on it? What should the gap between that therapy and collecting your T cells? All things, a lot of things here that we need to explore. And we can talk more, I think, in the panel. But in this interest of time, I'll go on. So everything I've shown you so far is a single arm study, but as you've heard, the benchmark for approval is phase three study. Okay, so these data all look good, but how does it compare to existing studies? There's a bunch of studies here that I'll show you, but the take home message is at the top. When you compare the two CAR-Ts, PHARMA and CARTITUDE-4, to their control arm, at the top, you see that uh, IDACEL led to 50% improvement over the control arm and the SILTACEL 75%, the best of anything we have here on this space. Um, so this is going to uh, undoubtedly lead to definitive approval for both products. And I know you all want to know when can I get it earlier. These studies will now support the movement from that six, you know, more than four lines of therapy, heavily treated population to maybe one to three lines of therapy like these studies. So this is what we've been waiting for. So once the regulatory agencies approve, uh, then payers will have to pay for it. But 
I just want to put out a caution. We still in the clinic have to deal with slot issues. If we only get a limited number of slots, we got to go give it to the patients who have limited options uh, before we can give it to the early slot, the relapse, right? So we collectively need to do better with more slots, more manufacturing capability. And so side effects about CAR-T, uh, same CRS that we talked about earlier, um, and there's some unique things, some neurologic toxicity, uh, and then of course, whatever's target specific. So I'm showing you the phase three study because now you can compare and contrast uh, with the control arm as opposed to all those other studies that were single arm. The infection rate was comparable, 27 versus 25%. Slightly more lowering of blood count, cytopenia 94 versus 86%. CRS was quite common, about 76%, but primarily low grade. Uh, there were very few high grade, 1% grade three. This um, ICANS, which is kind of neurotoxic, was low, 5%, grade one and two. And something that had shown up initial um, RT studies, which is we think not as much of a concern, is what we call movement and neurocognitive. Some of you may know about Parkinson's disease, where your body gets stiff and it's difficult to move. Some myeloma patients are getting that. Um, and it seems like that was probably because those patients were very sick and their disease was very uncontrolled going into those early CAR T studies. Now that we're moving it into earlier lines of therapy. We have better ways of controlling the myeloma. We're seeing less of those. And so just some uh, practical issues about, I've alluded to some of these, how do we give these therapies, whether it's bispecific or CAR-Ts? Um, there's REMS programs that, that you know, the FDA requires providers to be trained. Um, and this is a team effort. It's not just the doctors that you discuss with, but when you're admitted to the hospital, do the nurses know about CRS? They check the vital signs. They call the team when there's a fever. When the person who's there at overnight, I can tell you I've gotten more phone calls in the last three years than I've had in 20 years combined. CRS never happens at a convenient time. It's one in the morning, two in the morning. And so whoever's being called has to know what to do, that this isn't just another garden variety fever. It's a patient getting a bispecific or CAR-T. Uh, they need to intervene quickly, draw the labs, give the treatments that are listed there. Pharmacy needs to then mix those drugs quickly because if there's delays in mixing, that can also, we've had issues with that. And then the nurse who gets the drug needs to hang it um, so that the CRS is abrogated. And it takes a village. You need neurologists for the neurologic toxicity, radiologists, IC teams, infectious disease, emergency room staff need to be educated because if a patient walks into the ER in a bispecific, will they have a blank look? Uh, and we probably you know, have bracelets or other ways of uh, identifying in outpatient clinics as well. And finally, what if we had to pick putting CAR T versus bispecifics? Um, I, I would say that one of the limitations of CAR Ts is the cherry pick, right? So when those initial CAR T studies were done, I remember at Mount Sinai, at any given time, we had 40, 50 patients that were great for a CAR T. And when we got that one slot per month, you look at your list, okay, who's measurable, who's progressing, and who can actually wait for the manufacturing? So you pick the best of the best not the worst of the worst. And so with that cherry picking, uh, I would say that if a CAR-T's remission duration is less than 12 months, bi specifics are gonna do better. There's no cherry picking. Everybody gets the drug as soon as it's ready. Um, and then access is important. You heard about from Daryl, uh, the global availability of these drugs. You know, it's interesting in the US, uh, there's some studies show that only 12% of patients who are eligible for a transplant get it. So how is it gonna be for CAR-T, which is gonna be even more expensive, more restricted? Um, so access is going to be a big issue. And this is my kind of tutorial uh, summary. CAR-Ts are great, but they're like these Rolls-Royce phantoms, hard to get, rare. Now, um, this is not a cost comparison because the Toyota Corolla is actually make the world go around. There's about 50 million that are sold globally. But because guess what? Giving a Corolla every month for a year is probably just as expensive as a CAR-T. But it's, the point is, there's a lot more Corollas. You can get one. And so especially if you can do combination therapy, uh, this is great. But I, I do think one thing that we really should emphasize with the Rolls Royce is I put it at the bottom the remission duration, survival, and the quality of life of being off therapy cannot be overstated. And you don't need to tell you that. You guys know that. That I have patients for the first time traveling the world that have never been able to do that after having had myeloma for many, many years. And so that's great and cannot be uh, minimized. And I think I'll just pause there um, and Thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you so much, AJ. If have the panel come up again and we will
have uh, open discussion. Yeah. Clearly a lot of very, very exciting information. And uh, yeah, talk, you, talk you stay about right hope. there. Right, Dr. Dury, talk about hope. We've been building and building. Yeah, and yeah. Now it's like, so as I said, the, for me, this is beyond hope. This is a uh, tangible stuff <laughs> where you're, uh, it's available and uh, it's going to help you probably. And you need to just optimize uh, the use. Okay. So where are these questions? Missy, number two. Uh, Ajay, thank you so much for that. Uh, not hopeful, but also tangible uh, presentation, as Dr. Dury mentioned. So I hear a lot from patients that said uh, the viability of the CAR T was below what is approved by FDA, or they have to end up collecting a second or a third time uh, to get their CAR T processed. Is it their CAR T has they have been too pre-treated, or the manufacturing process has failed? Yeah, it's a great uh, question. Very annoying glitch with the FDA. Yeah, you want to explain that? So I think the second one, uh, we're understanding that there are certain therapies that probably are not good to give right before CAR-T. That includes things like um, melphalan or bendamustine. These are drugs that are going to lower your stem cell compartment, lower your counts. You want to try to avoid those if you're going to go to a CAR-T. As soon as your T cells are collected, then you can do whatever you want. But if you do that before the collection, that's not a good strategy. If you get your T cells collected, then there's this second issue. Um, in the clinical trials, there were these certain cutoffs that needed quality control measurements, and majority of patients met them. Once the commercial, uh, once they were FDA approved, the stringency was even higher. And so we're seeing more patients that are, quote, out of spec, out of specification. So they don't meet the FDA cutoff, which is higher than it was for the clinical trial. So we think there's still quite a bit buffer of room and most of those patients are moving forward, they may ask you to sign a consent form because the FDA wants more data, which is understandable. Like if you're going to do more of these out of spec RTs, we should make sure that the data are as good as the ones that are in spec. So you may be asked to sign a consent form. It's not a clinical trial per se, but it is uh, in terms of you're not getting a new experimental product, but they want your data so that we can then go and analyze them and say, okay, how did they pan out? So for the mass batch majority of patients, we are proceeding with out of spec, but with that extra proviso collection of data. Well, it's good that you're at least able to proceed, but yeah. that's a that's a big step forward. Um, yeah, do you want to comment on that? You had that issue uh, out of spec. I think that's with yeah. the uh, cartitude product, right? The, yeah. yeah more, so, so the, more so with, with the cell cell. Cell, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah, it's not a big deal, but I think the other thing is that uh, I don't think you really commented on is the real world data with CAR T cells. I think the problem is that, uh, you know, when we select in the right patient, you know, I think when CAR T cells became available, a lot of patients with advanced taking to CAR T cells before adequate bridging therapy. Can you comment on that? Well, in a way, it's, it's an oxymoron to say real world CAR T because the really sick patients, the fragile, elderly, renal failure, heart failure, they're not even getting CAR T. So right. there's a tremendous cherry picking, even if those who are getting CAR-T outside of clinical trials, because you're still picking patients with diseases. I would say the number one determinant of whether by or CAR-T explosive disease. If you have right. an explosive disease, you don't have the luxury of waiting for CAR-T. And you'd be much better served getting an off-the-shelf bispecific because it's better to be alive and in remission on a bispecific than waiting for a CAR-T. Uh, so but what uh, Rafat's also getting at is there are studies now talking about like renal failure patients, because if you have kidney failure or dialysis, the chemotherapy that's given before CAR-T, which I didn't mention in detail, but there's a fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, they're called conditioning therapy or lymphodepletion therapy. And so get the therapy right before the CAR-T. So you get your T-cells collected, there's manufacturing. And then before they're put in, you get these three days of fludarabine and cyclophosphamide. Well, those drugs are cleared by the kidneys. So if you have kidney failure, we're not really sure what to do with those doses. And so right. that's an unmet need that we need to understand. Um, the patients with heart failure, elderly, but preliminary data suggests that with the renal failure, it's not that different. But I think um, one we are seeing for the dismal outcomes is matched by the CAR-T data. For patients who get prior BCMA therapy, prior to BCMA CAR-T, those outcomes are like very poor. Um, we're talking three to six months. So I think right. um, we could do better uh, than that. So really try to... 
if you want to try to get a BCMA CAR T, if at all possible, try to avoid a BCMA directed therapy, at least in the immediate prior line of therapy. Right, right, right. Do you think there will be a place, we talk about next generation CAR T for um, fast CAR, you know, uh, there is the um, product uh, from uh, China that's presented at ASH, the fast CAR, where you don't have that weight. Uh, is, that, is that a way forward? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, the typical, what we call vein to vein time from T cell collection to infusion is probably six fish at least. So one effort to make the manufacturing shorter uh, using different vectors, seven to 14 days. And there's even a faster one, which is called allocar, right? Which is not patient derived, it's a, a donor derived car. So you, you take a donor cells and genetically modify them, allocar. So the fast cars look quite encouraging and we'll need to see larger numbers uh, to expand that. The allocar limitation is that there's extra chemotherapy given to minimize those T cells attacking the patient, right? Because these are foreign T cells, not your own T cells. And with that additional chemo comes even more infection. So there's a little bit of reluctance to go full, full hog on that, but really that would, because then that can be optimized. You could get the benefit of CAR-T without the repeated dosing of bispecifics. Right, right. Okay. All right. We've got plenty of questions, actually. So we'll, we'll keep our answers shorter. <laughs> no, 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 no. We just. <laughs> this is actually like a three part question. So I apologize. I always feel like I'm in biology class when I come to these conferences, but thank you for all the information. Um, so I think what I just heard you say kind of addressed one of my questions. So if a patient has kidney failure, my mom had light chain deposition, she was at 5%. They told her she was going to have to be on dialysis. She's now up to 25, 30%. Yay. No dialysis. So would she be a candidate that could have either one of these treatments? And specifically, I'm interested in the, sorry, bispecific um, that you were going over in the SIVO. You said that slide was outdated, but I didn't see all the same statistics down the whole column for SIVO. So is that one not yet approved? Because I didn't see the remission rate on that one. Yeah, we don't have that data yet. They have it's early, but yeah, the response is still in that 50, 60%. We don't have longer term follow up. But I would say when the, the clinical trials have cutoffs of kidney function because they were clinical trials, probably of clearance of 40 to 60%, depending on the study. But I can tell you that when these drugs get commercially approved, who got those drugs? It was those patients with heart failure, kidney failure, prior, anything that would have excluded them from the study. Well, I mean, now that they're approved, we can test and give, not, it's not test, but these patients need uh, therapies just as much as the rest of the group. The reason just, of course, those patients are excluded is when you have novel therapies, you need to determine what's coming from the patient, disease, and treatment. And if you put very sick patients, you can't tell apart whether it's side effects from the sick patient or the disease or the treatment. And so once these drugs are approved, most of our centers are much more comfortable doing those with patients who may not have met the study criteria, acknowledging that there's a data gap, right? We just don't have data, but I can tell you that from our experience, those patients did quite well, even uh, with kidney failure, all those other medical issues that had excluded them from study. Awesome. And so did I see it right on the slide that 98% under the SIVA? That's for Silta cell. Oh, okay. That's as a okay. part T. 98% okay. was Silta cell, yeah. Okay, yep. thank you. All right. So, all right. First of all, thank you for your time and your great presentation. Um, my question is, if you've had bi-specific antibody, like the Clistamab or Rana, uh, you go into remission, and then it, you, you start getting the disease again. Can you go back on the bi-specific antibody, or what is the next line of therapy? A great question. Um, up till now, most of the bispecific studies have treated to progression, so we never did, for most patients, we didn't stop them. The only exception was that SIVO study where I showed you about 17, 18 patients where they stopped it. And even those patients, we don't have a lot of data about retreatment. Um, some of those patients, I think the few that were treated, uh, did seem to benefit. So I think the general adage in myeloma is if you stop a therapy for either side effects or you intended, or you just didn't want to continue, um, you can retreat, but if you treat it to progression, usually you don't go back to that same drug 
unless you're going to do it in combination with something else. Because once this is an arms race, if the myeloma learns how to beat a treatment, you need to be smarter and do something else with it if you're going to use it again. Right. 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 I, I'm curious if you yeah. well, uh, I'll just comment one thing. So uh, AG's colleague, uh, Tom Martin, is uh, running this uh, immune therapy registry, which is collecting the real world uh, data for the approved uh, bispecifics and CAR-T. And that's the sort of thing that we'll learn. You know, if, if for some patients will be off and then they get another one, we will see what is the impact. Uh, and is that time dependent or, you know, sequence dependent? Yeah. No, no, I mean, I think you raise a very important point. I said, if you're relapsing, why on by specific is different if you relapse off it a year later? Because when you're relapsing on it, we're actually presenting data at the IMS, the International Myeloma Society meeting, that, you know, that BCMA will mutate. And, it'll be, and uh, you know, it's like a lock and a key. So your key will not open that lock because it changed. And that's what be finding is that the BCMA gene has mutated. So it's a different story. I mean, it's been off it for a year. I think maybe it's a different disease than the one while you're relapsing on it. Yep. Okay. All right. So, uh, Robin, I'm, uh, I'm hoping you're keeping track of the time, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> Please go ahead, whoever it is that's got the mic. Okay. Oh, it's over here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I had a question about the Selenex. I don't know if I said that right. Selenexor? Selenexor uh, um, being used for a bridge treatment to get you to CAR-T. That's not one of the treatments that's going to inhibit the response of the CAR-T. It's a good question. So it's one of the things that we're having to do to play, uh, you know, I think the panel knows we have to play games with insurance companies. So let's say we have somebody who wants, we want to get to CAR-T, but you need four lines of therapy. We'll sometimes do a regimen, um, not that we're intending to use it forever, but that meets the four lines and then the payer has to pay for it, right? So, uh, but you can, there's no payers. We'll delete that part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, Selenexor, which we studied a lot at Sinai, um, is actually, there's some data showing that it may actually activate these cells. So uh, to date, it's being used quite a bit in this population. And especially at UCSF, I just had a call with the pharmacist. They're like, I'm seeing a lot more Selenexor use. Like I said, I can tell you why, because at the meetings, they're trying to give it that fourth line of therapy. But so far, we don't have any data that it impairs T-cell collection. And in the laboratory, it actually suggests that it may potent potentiate T-cell function. So so far, still good, unless the panel has other comments. Right. Rafat is not keen to comment, apparently. <laughs> uh, I mean, her question was about bridging, isn't it? Yeah. Or yeah, so he, we've had... After you um, collect the T-cell. We've had four, three failures, so this would be four going into CAR-T, you know, in that yeah. window. Um, sorry, I had a follow-up question as well. You ex uh, mentioned exploding um, myeloma. Should exploding? I be expecting any spontaneous combustion um, <laughs> family member? <laughs> so um, actually, you know, a good example, the Selenexor, the, the paper that led to that accelerated approval, in that study, the patients who signed consent from the day they signed consent to the day they started treatment, which is 12 days, their proteins increased by 22% in 12 days. That's very rapidly progressive. And you can imagine six weeks in that patient could be devastating. Right? right, because it's just taking up. So we mean this rapidly progressing. And I think your question and Rafat's answer also highlights one thing we should clarify. There's the chemo you get before your T-cell collection, and then there's the chemo you get while your T-cells are being manufactured. It's that second period that we call bridging chemo, which is your T-cells are collected. That we're less concerned about what you do because your T-cells have already been collected. So we should separate out those two things, what happens before T-cell and what you're doing to tread the water while your CAR-Ts are Right. Very important. Okay. Uh... I've... That's it. Oh. Oh. Okay. Oh. I have a quick question in regards to CAR T T cell harvesting. Okay. Is it important um, during therapy to get T cells like early on before? A patient has lots of treatment, kind of like stem cell. You know, they, they only want you having right. like four 
months of treatment max before you get your stem cell harvesting. Right. So will that be the case for CAR T or do you guys know that? And if that is important, what time in treatment? Right, right. So this is increasingly an important question, uh, especially as we were saying, we want to try to use the CAR T maybe earlier and earlier in the disease course. And one advantage of that is that the T cells would be in better shape and easier to harvest. Um, so do you want to comment about that? Uh, you know, the, yeah. Sure. Um, well, let's start with the data. Cardiotrude 1, which was those about 100 patients who had a response rate of 98, 5 plus percent and a remission of three years. Those patients on average had six different chemotherapies over six, seven years. So that tells us it works in that heavily treated population. So it's different than collecting your stem cells because I would venture that if you try to collect CD34 positive autologous stem cells for a standard malflan autotransplant, it would be very difficult in that patient population. So T cells are very different than CD34 positive stem cells. But um, I think what you're also asking is now that we have that data, now we have that good phase three study and we think this will get approved earlier, should we start collecting earlier? And the answer to that is ideally, yes, but the practicality is you still have to get insurance approval. You, you can't just collect T cells because the T cells have to be collected and sent to a lab. That lab will only accept it if all of those paperwork's been dotted, T I's have been dotted, T's crossed, et cetera. So for now, the practicality is you need to meet the indications. Currently, it's four or more lines of therapy. The minute it becomes one to three lines of therapy, we'll certainly start collecting earlier. And there are ongoing studies to even collect right after diagnosis. Um, there are studies to try to cure myeloma, right? Which is moving everything up earlier and earlier. So um, this will move up, as uh, Ryan said earlier, everything starts very much to the right and moves to the left, but, um, but it will happen. Yeah. Okay. Stem cell collection done. Um, earlier this year's, could they use that if I decided to go? You no, it's it? a, Part it's two? different. Yeah. Different. It's different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Different. Yeah. Dr. It's different. in the back. <laughs> Hi there. First of all, thank you so much for coming today. It's because of your relentless pursuits to help myeloma patients that we can all be here today. So thank you for that. Um, yeah. But there were a couple of us talking about plasma cytomas. A few of us were diagnosed because of plasma cytomas. I had a really large one on my T12 and was no longer able to walk. Thanks to Dr. MD Anderson, I have a bunch of hardware and can walk now. But the question we had is, um, having been diagnosed with plasma cytomas, does that change the prognosis or risk? And then the second question is, how often should imaging be done, especially if there's no M-spike, just light chain only disease? when we've had plasma cytomas um, right. that our diagnosis was based so, on. Yeah, so I'll just comment for, I mean, in, in general, uh, having the plasma cytomas is a high risk, a higher risk factor. Now, actually, early in the disease, it may or may not be uh, a higher risk factor. Uh, uh, plasma cytomas at the time of initial diagnosis uh, is not quite as difficult and problematic as later in the disease, extramedullary disease plasma cytomas is uh, usually in a setting of a, a disease that's difficult to treat. But that may not be quite the same early in the disease. But uh, yeah, I mean, diagnosing uh, somebody with an isolated plasma cytoma up front is uh, different than people who had myeloma for a long time and now they have multiple plasma cytomas. What is a plasma cytoma? It's basically tumor of myeloma cells. So it can present anywhere behind the eye and somewhere else and the throat. Uh, those can be, you know, if it's an isolated, you know, you can radiate it or, you know, and uh, the question is that, what do you do to monitor the patient? You do a PET scan once a year. I mean, you may want to start with that just to see that uh, not recurring. I think the, I, I, we estimate the evolving into myeloma is about 30% patient who was isolated in myeloma. So, but I think frequent imaging in that studying is going to be the key. Right. Yeah, the, the French, the IFM in France, they did a study uh, and uh, PET-CT was the most useful tool for monitoring the plasma cytomas. And so, uh, you know, once a year, which is sort of like the baseline, uh, but the problem is with the reimbursement. Uh, but 
uh, related to treatment, if you're taking a new treatment and if you want to know if the treatment's working, uh, you would want to do it probably at six months or something. Yeah. And so this is uh, one of those challenging things to get reimbursement to do what you need to do. So I would just add, I think um, you can think about myeloma as non-secretory, where there's absolutely no proteins made. Then there's what we call oligosecretory, which is a little bit, but not enough to say meet a clinical trial to enter. And there's standard secretory myeloma. Each of those three populations can have plasma cytomas in parallel, right? And so if you're a non-secretory patient with plasma cytomas, the imaging is even more important because you don't have anything to monitor. If you're a secretory patient with plasma cytomas, then you have to see how well they correlate. One other thing I would add is that I think we need to study extramedullary disease more. And um, we like to biopsy these patients because sometimes when you do a random hip biopsy, which no one loves, but that comes back normal fish. But if you took the trouble to biopsy the more aggressive clone of extramedullary paramedullary, that's where all the money's at, where you see the high risk features. And we need right. to start studying those patients more because if, if we're going to improve those patients, we need to understand the science and biology. So I, I would encourage people, if your institution has protocols to try to get those biopsies, those aren't going to be done at the bedside. They'll be done under radiology with CT guided by interventional radiologists, but that'll help us. And you maybe even benefit as a person by, um, if you find targetable mutations in that particular plasma cytoma, it's another tool in your arsenal of anti-myeloma weapons. Right, right. The other thing I mentioned, uh, I think yesterday, is that um, with mass spectrometry, with the very sensitive mass spec, uh, um, QTOF, um, it may be that even in what we call non-secretary relapse, we may be able to find a little bit of protein. And so with mass spectrometry, that will give you a simple blood test that might be possible to monitor uh, uh, the treatment uh, uh, with uh, extramedullary disease, which would cut back on the need for imaging, perhaps. Sure. Hi, thank you guys for coming so much and um, informing us in, of all this. Um, my question is, is this genetic? And how long would it be in your body before? I mean, how long was it in his body before it just finally decided to come out? So there's two questions right yeah, there. <laughs> so, so there is a, a low level uh, genetic risk, and we could, I guess we could do it here. But um, in general, if you ask a population of 100 myeloma patients, is there anybody else in the family that has had uh, myeloma or a kind of similar blood cancer? The answer to that question is yes, about 6 or 7% of the time. It's actually fairly consistent. It's a low level. Uh, so. Uh, that it could occur with it. So there is a what we call a predisposition uh, at a low level. It's not it's not uh, like some other diseases where there's a fifty percent risk that you know someone else in the family would get uh, myeloma. Now the the uh, the other part of the question is um, you know what are the genetic factors that could uh, lead to myeloma. You know, is there a particular gene, a bad gene? You you know about breast cancer, where there's the BCA gene. Uh, you know, do, is there a bad myeloma gene? <laughs> and the answer to that is uh, no. Um, all, so, by studying families, one other uh, project that the myeloma that the IMF uh, uh, sponsored was to study families with myeloma to see well what was the genetic feature within the family that was predisposing uh, multiple cases of myeloma in the family. And so the first thing that we learned is that uh, the genetic pattern was different in each family. So uh, we learned that there are multiple different patterns. So some were gene factors that influenced the immune system. So there was a defect in the immune system that was predisposing to myeloma in some families. Others were uh, differences in the ability to break down toxic chemicals in the environment, and that can, can be a predisposing factor to myeloma. But basically, every family, every family had different uh, genetic uh, factors. Uh, so in uh, Iceland, uh, we're doing this study where we're, we studied the whole population of Iceland, and uh, the thing about Iceland is that they have had their full genetic profile done. 
So we know the genetics of everybody in Iceland. Uh, and we know the genetics of the people who have myeloma. And we know the, <laughs> the people that don't have myeloma. And so uh, Sigurdur Christensen is actually, right now, we're, we're at the point in the analysis where he's looting, looking at the genetic profile. Now, this is not the genetic profile of the myeloma. This is the genetic profile of the people, you know, what we call germline genetics, uh, to study what is the difference in the genetic par pattern of people who get myeloma versus people uh, who don't. So we will learn more about that. And it may be that we'll have the ability to come up with ideas or interventions that could reduce the risk of myeloma actually developing in, uh, in that type of population. Anyway. Dr. Dury, right over here. Yeah, uh, thank you all. Does it matter as this moves out into the myeloma world, if people have diabetes or are being treated for heart or potentially as we get older, something with dementia, what are the relationships between all these new treatments and other illnesses? Right. Um, <laughs> uh, well, there are some cross uh, correlations. Um, there are cross correlations between myeloma and certainly other blood cancers and also some other uh, non-blood cancers. Uh, several groups have shown cross correlations with uh, with other uh, cancers. And then as far as other diseases, um, uh, actually in Iceland, they've been systematically looking at that, the cross correlations with other, the other diseases. Um, anyone want to comment on that? I mean, there are some cross correlations. Well, I mean, but the most important thing is that you have to have an oncologist taking care of you really, who's an internist, understand diabetes, understand cardiac issues. Because the question is that, is there a relationship between myeloma and diabetes? We can hear, you know, speculate and say, yes, there's a relationship. But the most important thing is that when I'm managing you for your multiple myeloma, I'm not going to exacer exacerbate, uh, you know, the diabetes and make your heart fail. You know, so it's very important that we understand the drug we use and make sure it doesn't really affect the diabetes and the heart and the kidneys. And so that's why the difference between somebody who look at you as a subject, you walk into their clinic and they don't pay attention to the glucose and don't pay attention to the other things in your blood test and just focus on you and the myeloma protein. So it's very important that, you know, some of the best thing I do to my patient is that sometimes I stop certain drugs because they're causing them harm. So these are really the most important thing. So, but if, you know, myeloma is going to make diabetes worse, we don't know, but the treatment can. Right, right. And the other way around, you know, we don't know. I mean, you know, for example, we know uh, from studies that were done at a VA hospital in St. Louis, if you have the pre-myeloma condition, MAGAS, and you were, and the, uh, you know, and they look at two groups, uh, they follow them over time. I mean, not follow them, they look backward. And the patient, the group that had obesity had four and a half times a chance of developing multiple myeloma. So maybe obesity has a role, but we cannot prove that yet. So what we tell our patient is that, you know, stay active, eat right, low carbohydrate, especially when you're on a steroid, and hopefully that will make you feel better and maybe not stimulate myeloma cells because, for example, obesity is an inflammatory state, and any inflammation can stimulate plasma. Right. So I have a question actually for um, uh, Dr. Cherry. Uh, I think that as we move the treatments uh, to the earlier position, uh, you know, in the relapse setting, we, we want to have a drug that works and is tolerable. As you move it to an earlier se situation where a patient might live 10, 20, even 30 years, then some of these other things come into play. Will it ultimately increase the risk of uh, diabetes or this or that or the other, you know? Uh, and one thing that I was thinking about is that some of these new uh, biospecifics. So this past week, this new one, talquetamide, Talvi, uh, against this new target, uh, CPRC5D, uh, very, very good. But it has these crazy side effects. Uh, that affects the skin, uh, the, the nails, and the taste. Uh, and so 
we need to be cautious about that. I mean, will a newly diagnosed patient be happy about that? <laughs> you know, and uh, does it go away? Uh, you know, uh, do you want to comment on that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think probably the biggest. Oh, interactions, negative interactions. Oh, what all of the other drugs do right. necessarily. Right, it could, it could have, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's another part is that these new therapies could have major negative interactions with other drugs for diabetes or heart or blood pressure or who knows what, right? Yeah. But what? that's why we have pharmacists on our yeah, team, that, they're called PharmD. Yeah. That they yeah, yeah, the yeah. drug interaction. Okay. Yeah, we have the speed down to the pharmacy for that. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of points I would make on your question. First is I think secondary cancers we should talk about because right. we've, I mean, we you probably all heard that after transplant, lenalidomide or Revlimid increases the risk of secondary cancers. When that finding came around, people went back to see when does this risk start? Because again, is it because of the patient, the disease, or the treatment, or all of those? And what was interesting is that even smoldering and MGUS patients have a higher risk of secondary cancers. Right. So we can't blame it all on treatment because part of it is if you have whatever genetic predisposition that led to getting myeloma, it does put you at other risk for other cancers as well, independent of the treatment. transplant and revlimid. Certainly our treatments can augment that, but that's why also, and this comes back to CAR-T as well. One of the concerns about CAR-T moving earlier is when you're manipulating the DNA, there is a risk of this; these viruses potentially um, creating other cancers. And so one of the things that all CAR-T patients are, when you're signing a consent form for a CAR-T clinical trial, the secondary cancer is being collected indefinitely. That's an FDA requirement. They want these long-term toxicities to be collected. And so it is important because I think it's one thing to have a three-year remission and be treatment-free in a heavily treated patient. But if that's gonna come with additional long-term side effects, that might be a different calculus in a newly diagnosed patient. But the good news is so far, we're not seeing those signals. And that's where we, these randomized studies are so helpful because the single arm studies, you have nothing to compare to. But in the phase three studies so far, there doesn't look to be any long-term follow-up with the major caveat that it may not be followed up long enough. Right, right. But can I ask you if talquetamab moves oh, yeah. up early, um, do those uh, weird things go away? Yeah, so good <laughs> news is... Um, the, all of those side effects do improve when you discontinue therapy. Right. Taste comes back, nails recover, um, and the skin rash is quite self-limiting. Yeah. Um, but I think also we need to be thinking about the dose and schedule, right? There's a difference between using it at the particular dose for heavily treated patients versus what you might use in combination in a less heavily treated patient. Right. You may be able to get away with a little bit, a lot well, less. Right. And this also goes to your question about drug interactions. One of the nice things about the immunotherapy is typically these immunotherapies have no interactions, right? They're, they're monoclonal antibodies or bispecific or tri-specific. They don't have the same drug interactions that pills do. And that's one of the nice things about these. They have their own issues, but the drug interactions are less common. Right. Okay. Other questions? Questions? Oh, I see Sherry. Kelly, who's close? Get it. It's a race. <laughs> who's going to get it? Um, so, Dr. Chari, I think earlier you were talking about um, mutations in the bone marrow. So when you're first diagnosed and you have that first bone marrow and they're looking, the fish testing and the cytogenetics, can those cytogenetics that you would see or not see at your first bone marrow, first diagnosis, can they change? and develop new ones down the road. Like I'm standard risk. I don't have yeah. any high risk features, but, and it's been almost 12 years. Could one year down the road, if I have another bone marrow biopsy, new yep. um, mm -hmm. high risk or not high risk features appear? Good question. Yeah, I think um, for, assuming that you have a good quality aspirate at the baseline and they were able to collect the myeloma cells, if somebody has a translocation at baseline, it tends to persist indefinitely. It's usually translocations tend not to appear later. 
other changes like deletion 17P and chromosome one changes can accumulate, and that is very well known. As a patient relapses with after multiple lines of therapy, you can see um, high-risk features. For example, in the CAR-Ts and bispecifics, the percentage of patients that are high risk is probably 30 to 50%, whereas in newly diagnosed, it may be closer to 20, 30%. So we know that there's accumulating, accumulating genetic damage that, and part of this is kind of like weeds, right? Like you pull out the easy weeds and then the ones that come back are more recalcitrant and then you get the next and you're just constantly getting the worst of the worst. Right. Um, and, and that's what's amazing about these immunotherapies. We're getting such amazing right, results right. in the worst of the worst. Right. Um, but it does tend to be a variation on the original clone. And so yeah. if it was good earlier, it tends to be good, although there could be some additional things that happens. But if it was bad earlier, then it could be bad, plus have some other stuff. The other thing is that fish is really not a very sensitive assay. I mean, basically what you're doing is you're taking the bone marrow and you use yeah. seven different probes and you say, okay, do you have 17P deletion? Do you have a gain of 1Q? So there's a lot of movement. And now actually we replace at our institution fish by next generation sequencing, looking at the 300 different gene mutation deletion developed by Brian Walker that has been studied at, by different, at different institutions. And we think that's a better, more comprehensive panel. Obviously, we need to have that adopted more you know, widely to see how important that to help us understand patients better. But I, I really think fish will be replaced. I mean, I think it's just not a very sensitive. It's not a good test at all, no. Uh, and we've known that for a long time. Basically, you have a pathologist looking to see if there's a red dot next to a, a yellow dot. You know, it's, it's, and depending on uh, what kind of a day they're having, they may or not be seeing the red and the yellow dots. You know, uh, we, we need a better system. And that's uh, not looking at some of the precise genetics that we really need to know about. I was going to add, in addition to being more precise, I think um, one a thing I always like to tell people, one of my expressions is movies are more interesting than photographs. And what I mean by that is genomics at baseline is one part of the equation, but what's more important is what happens to that patient, right? And so we now know there's a group of patients who are standard risk, but if their relapses are occurring much faster than it would have been expected, we call that functionally high risk. It means that we probably, we don't have all the answers for gen risk stratification right. yet, right? Because if they had favorable ISS, favorable genetics, and yet they're relapsing much earlier, we need to study those patients. And those patients should be treated more aggressively in spite of whatever the crystal ball might have said on day one. Yeah, this is an area where we're, we're hopefully going to see changes, you know, and the risk will depend on the therapies. Uh, you know, we don't know all the risk uh, factors related to these in, immune therapies. Uh, some will work well in the in the high risk exomodulary, uh, maybe not, you know, we've got a lot to learn. Yeah, so basically what we do to address actually uh, a, a point is that when you take a bone marrow aspirate, you, you're going to take blood and you're going to take bone marrow and things like that. So what we do is we take the bone marrow aspirate and we isolate what we call CD138 cells. These are the myeloma cells. And then we... Those uh, are the... Uh, 38, yeah, okay. And basically what we do is we will, uh, you know, do DNA sequencing and look for certain mutations, deletions, translocations that are more than just the seven been public, 300 of those. So, uh, so we call it next generation sequencing for better, uh, you know, definition. Right, right. So actually one of the things that we learned uh, recently when we were analyzing this, um, Obviously, for the 1114, where you might want to use venetoclax, the question is, when you do a bone marrow, how reliable is that to pick up the 1114? And it's very much dependent on whether or not you enhance with the CD38. You need to take that CD38 population, so that then, uh, which is the myeloma, and study the myeloma to see if it has the 1114. So these are tests that need, need to be better, actually. and. Um, you need to not only make sure that it's a, a, a good bone marrow sample, but also that it's purified for the myeloma. And then Dr. Chari was mentioning CD34. CD34 is for the normal marrow and CD38 is for the myeloma. So there's two different antibodies. CD34 is for the normal stem cells. So they're collecting the normal stem cells. 38 is the myeloma. 
Okay, let's see if this can be as complex a question. Yeah. Uh, with all the different options when you have relapsed or refractory myeloma, is anything more being done um, with precision medicine besides the, you know, 14 translocation and venetoclax? Does any data come out about other genetic sequences that can, you know, inform us? Yeah, good question. Any other selective therapy? Uh, well, there's a 414 you were touching on, right? Yeah, so there's a my drug study uh, that is being done, which is actually, it's like a basket study. So it's based on whatever profile. So example would be 414, BRAF, um, uh, RAS mutations. So there's a bunch of mutations that um, we have targetable drugs for, some of them coming from other cancers like skin cancer, breast cancer, et cetera. Um, the challenge has been so far, I mean, I, we definitely should put people on clinical trials to understand that. But in my experience in using these off-label and very advanced patients over the years who before the immunotherapy era in particular, you would get some transient benefit. And I think part of the complexity, my, multiple myeloma is called that obviously, because in, in <laughs> contrast to plasma cytoma, you have multiple spots. But another reason we should call it myeloma is that in a given patient, you can have different clones. And sometimes these targeted therapies are good for one clone, but you haven't done anything for the other clone. So it seems like myeloma is not going to be, you know, the, I think the only physician that's been on the cover of Time Magazine is Brian Drucker for Gleevec, <clears throat> which is CML you can target as, as you heard. Philadelphia right, chromosome. With this single drug, because it's a single mutation that causes that disease and you block it with a single drug or pathway. Myeloma is not that straightforward. It's like diabetes and high blood pressure. If it was a single pathway, we wouldn't yeah. be having all of these issues. So yeah. I think we need to study this more um, and probably we need to do both targeted therapy as well as some therapy to take care of the non-targeted components. Yeah, it's, Both are probably present. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Um, there is a, a, a team in Australia, actually, Andrew Spencer and his team, uh, they are targeting these RAS mutations that you're talking about. So they have a technique where they study the RAS mutations and there are therapies from lung cancer and other cancers where we do have drugs for that uh and so but um but the beauty today we have the bispecific and the car t cells yeah. don't care what's inside the cells they're attacking the target on this uh surface yeah cma and other right so, so that, we're actually that, in good shape <laughs> the, so this is this is the 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 most crucial point is that when the bcma and the uh talquetamab are working it, it doesn't really matter what the genetics are but it's, it's just about what was the uh, surface receptor that is being targeted. Um, did, did you have, or Jonathan? Yep, right here. Before I was diagnosed, my blood pressure was at like 160 over 100. And then after I was put on a four drug regimen, DRVD, uh, my blood pressure went down to 120 over 80. And then recently, they started tapering down that, getting me ready for a stem cell transplant, and my blood pressure is starting to rise again. And it's just puzzling to me why that is. If any, if you have any idea of those drugs I've taken, had an effect on my Were you pressure. dehydrated from your Revel Med and because you had a lot of diarrhea or something like that? Every week I'd go, and it'd be 120 over 80 for like 10 weeks in a row. And now it's starting to elevate again, you know, oh. as... as we cut down the relevant and we cut down on the um, Velcade and we've cut down on the Dex. So were you taking any uh, blood pressure or heart medicines? No. So we looked at this um, because one of the drugs that we use extensively in myeloma, carfilzomib is known to increase high blood pressure. And when we were studying and very rarely cardiac issues as well. So when we looked at that data set, we broadened the question and I think mm -hmm. So this goes back to the other question of are there conditions that occur with myeloma? So part of when you're newly diagnosed, there could be several factors that are contributing to higher blood pressure. One is bone pain. Pain is very well known to increase blood pressure. So if you had bone disease that was not treated, that could have been a cause. Secondly, renal dysfunction, which is obviously another feature of myeloma. Renal failure does have physiologic changes in the body that also increase blood pressure. So those are two reasons that could be causing it. Weight changes could be another reason that could be affecting blood pressure. So if, uh, as Raf uh, Rafat was mentioning, if you, maybe if you lost weight and then you regained it because of side effects, that could be affecting. Those would probably be my, my three leading contenders for blood pressure changes. 
And anxiety is another big one too, right? Anxiety can increase blood pressure. So if you were newly diagnosed and not feeling well and you didn't know what was going on, lots of reasons. Thank you. Maybe you're feeling calmer because you've responded well to treatment. (laughs) (laughs) All right, over here. My questions are around um, the T cells. And my understanding is people who have cancer, um, uh, plenty of people who do not have cancer, we have abnormal cells. The system, our systems recognize them, kill them. Obviously, right. with myeloma, that does not happen. Is it possible that our T cells are dysfunctional? And that is why when these uh, mutant cells start forming, they're not being cleared out. And also, as I understand it, one of the problems has been T cells get exhausted, even with the CAR T's and the bispecific. So, um, you know, are we relying on uh, dysfunctional or lazy T cells and now sending them off to, to do battle? This is a very uh, insightful question. uh, And Do you want to comment on that? I've got some comments I can give, but please go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, the first thing comment is we are studying this. Uh, So actually, this is one of the projects that is going on in uh, Iceland with Sigurdur Christensen, where we screened the whole population. But Sigurdur, uh, actually, uh, I set up a collaborative between the uh, Iceland team and the Spanish team. So samples go from Iceland to Spain. And then what Dr. Alberto Orfeo does in Salamanca is he's been studying uh, the immune cells in uh, patients with uh, MGUS. And we have the ability now to study patients who um, have very, very tiny levels of disease uh, using mass spectrometry. And so um, it's been known for a long time that um, the immune system goes down related to myeloma and to the progression of myeloma. The question is, uh, when does that start and you know what is causing it? But what the results are tending to show is that there is in fact uh, kind of like an immune Achilles heel that is kind of a predisposing factor. And so that an underlying immune defect actually could be uh, a, an important background aspect of the development and the tendency for progression or not. I completely agree with that. I think one of the things we have not done a good enough job of studying in myeloma is, so we we talked a lot about genomics. So the you can take genomic alterations in myeloma and those can be seen in smoldering and MGUS. So that doesn't necessarily mean those patients, just because you have the genetic alterations doesn't mean you have MGUS is suddenly myeloma, right? So uh, the scientific interpretation of that is a genomic alteration is neither necessary nor sufficient for myeloma, which means there's more to this question, which is, the immune system probably. So we, we only look at the myeloma compartment, but the whole other part of the equation is where is the myeloma living in the bone marrow? And this would also fit with who gets myeloma typically is older patients, right? So as you're getting older, your immune system may be not as robust and that could be one of the reasons. So we definitely need to study these in a global fashion and prospectively. But then your second question is also very inter- important and interesting, but we should separate out CAR T's and bispecifics. Um, CAR T's, the exhaustion plays a role in what you're collecting because you're going to collect the T cells and expand them. So that's probably why it's not a good idea to collect somebody who's just coming off a bispecific, right? Because bispecific, you keep giving, and it's what we call antigenic pressure and T cell exhaustion. So what that means is that if you keep like slamming, you know, trying to get these assassins to kill or, you know, putting a rope on a horse or whatever, you're beating, you're flogging them to the point where they just give up. And at that point, if you're harvesting those T cells and then trying to make a great CAR T, you're probably not doing a good job. However, if you get good T cells, genetically modify them and put them into a CAR T, the beauty of CAR T is it's one and done. So those T cells expand and die off and then that's it. And then whatever happens right. downstream is not an issue. In contrast, bispecifics are hampered by the exhaustion. So when you keep doing it over and over, in fact, it was an interesting paper in a different disease, um, leukemia. It was a laboratory model, but they showed that if you give a bispecific continuously versus scheduled breaks, it suggested that there was less exhaustion and more cell killing when you gave breaks. But we need more clinical data. So I'm not saying run out there and change your schedule, but I'm 
what I'm getting at is there is rationale to study it, different doses and schedules of bispecifics. We're just in the cusp, the beginning of, of this um, knowledge, right. and I think we'll need to study all of these things. Yeah, you can see that there are several <laughs> dozen projects right there to, to understand this a little better. Uh, where next generation CAR T cells will focus on the features of the CAR Ts and uh, make sure you're enhancing and growing the ones that are going to be helpful. But we do know that um, these exhausted T cells, they do build up uh, at the time of relapse so that uh, we have some serial monitoring. Uh, also done, uh, the Spanish team have done quite a bit of work on this where um, as, as the myeloma is relapsing, it coincides with a buildup of these exhausted T cells. Yeah, and, and the story is by specific is that we worry about cytokine release syndrome and we worry about neurotoxicity, but really the problem is that down the road when they have the, the unusual infection. And so why the patient is having unusual infection? Because we're exhausting the T cells. We engaging them with, you know, with this bispecific antibody and then they just don't function well. So I think that will make the case also not just to you know keep the efficacy of these cells get rid of myeloma, but also spare some T cells to help you fight infections. So that's really it's going to be very important that we understand that because we cannot keep giving bispecific forever. I think it's a dangerous thing probably in the long run. Right, right. So the introduction of these immune therapies has really triggered a, a renewed interest in understanding this immune regulatory space in the bone marrow and uh, outside the bone marrow. Over here, Dr. Dury. I guess it's a follow-on question to that. Um, you presented uh, some other T cell, well, other subsets of cells that are being used for cell therapy. So I've heard about uh, NK CAR, for example. Um, and then also, I think macrophages, is that right, also have been used? Um, have you also investigated other T cell subsets like T regs or how that influences the immune um, uh -huh. environment in terms of the progression yep. of disease or suppression? Right. Another uh, several dozen projects right there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are ongoing NK uh, CAR, uh, these are donor NKs. Uh, so, Faith Therapeutic is doing those trials. We're just in the dose escalation part of it, so we don't really know about the efficacy. So we'll, we'll stay tuned for that. Right. It's well, uh, uh, a broad comment uh, is that, um, and, and several people, I think everyone has really mentioned this uh, the last couple of days, is that the good news right now is that we, we do have several uh, options uh, of areas where we know the treatment works. I mean, I remember 20 and 30 years ago, we were struggling to find what kind of treatment works for myeloma. But now we know, we know that these immune therapies work. Uh, and so this is great news to look across the spectrum and really assess. Uh, but we do need to keep an open mind uh, in terms of uh, what treatment will work in the short term and what might be ideal uh, in the long term. Because we have learned from, uh, and this was a study that was done in Heidelberg in Germany, uh, uh, um, Hartmut Goldschmidt, he looked at the immune status of patients who had lived for 20 years with myeloma. And he looked at the immune status in the microenvironment. And the immune microenvironment, it's not normal, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so we need to just focus on um, the immune defects and myeloma that are present initially and uh, how they might evolve over time and what would be the best immune therapy that would compensate for the uh, defects either primary or acquired so there have every there all of the things you mentioned are being studied so nk, uh, NK cells have been studied in other malignancies and have shown quite potent efficacy and the beauty of nk cells is you don't see the crs in myeloma, we haven't seen that much efficacy to date, but that work is still early, so we need to see that. NK cells are also being explored as bispecific and trispecific. So in the same way we talked about for CD3 and these other targets, it's being combined with NK cell antigens and these other targets, including BCMA. Uh, macrophages have been implicated, as have also been, um, the myeloid subsets have also been implicated, but we haven't yet studied those formally as cells per se. Um, and Tregs, I believe you also mentioned, and so Tregs are the the negative players. They suppress the immune system. So 
we do know that um, CAR T's, the more stem cell like they have and the less T regs they have, the better the outcomes are. And so there's a lot of efforts to manipulate the CAR T product with the right you know, memory cell to effector cell to the um, T to T regs, but and then in bispecifics also higher T regs have been implicated. And one of the interesting things that can help with this is actually uh, CD38 monoclonal antibodies. Um, the aritumumab, isatuximab actually target CD38, and those can be expressed on these T regs. And so that may be one of the reasons why, for example, tal monotherapy remission is 14 months, but when you add GARA, it looks like it's 19 months. Again, we need to see that they're, they're not a head-to-head -head study, um, but uh, and CD38 also, uh, CD38 monoclonal antibodies also affect NK cells, so we need to look at all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 But well, we do know in myeloma that the NK cells are um, abnormal. Uh, they're abnormal in numbers and also in function. So we know that there's probably some solution uh, that links in with NK cells, uh, as well as macrophages. Um, so it could be that, you know, we've been so focused on the genetics, on the fish testing, on the sequence analysis, but actually uh, some of the major answers may come from better uh, immune evaluation and, you know, testing all these different variations. Okay. Oh. Ah. We're getting into, we, uh, after we have, after lunch, and we have some pretty heavy duty questions. Uh, <laughs> I think it was all the good food, yeah. brain food, right? Desserts. This is a smart group. I think they yeah, give you- Yeah, absolutely. We, we need a, uh, an award to give to the attendees, uh, yeah. the, the smart group of attendees. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So that may that may wrap up our right. group of attendee questions. And All so right. if, if you just stay there one more second, one, there's lots of these extra programs available. If you want to bring them home to others, your support group, your healthcare team, you know, these might be some really good slides to share with them. And your badges, when you leave, hand them to staff and we'll pick them up and collect them and recycle them. And I'm just wondering, is there anyone from the IMF staff that had anything they wanted to wrap up and say before we leave? Alina, yes, grab your pearls. Everybody, I wanted to say thank you so much for listening to me talk yesterday. And as we leave today, remember there are a lot of fundraisers happening right here. Do you remember where? It's the funnest word to say. Rancho Cucamonga. Uh, there is a walk uh, happening there. Go see them. There is still a flyer outside. Scan the code. Sign up today September um, or sign up tomorrow. It's really easy. You are the reason that we are able to do what we do. All of you who has supported us in the past, present, and future, we are so thankful. And before all of you doctors leave, remember yesterday I told you we're celebrities? Will you guys sign my booklet if I give it to you? <laughs> oh, five dollars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so much. Oh, Robin, back to you. Here you yeah. go. Close this out. So in sync with that, I mean, I, I and uh, you can pass the book around. I really do want to thank our panelists. Uh, as you guys know, I mean, uh, th these are busy times. All these immune therapies have side effects and uh, as well as working well, but uh, this is very challenging uh, for nurses as well as doctors <laughs> to be handling all of these things and to take time out of their busy schedules to be here and to help with this. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>